श्रोताओं मैं महेश चंद्र त्यागी रिटायर्ड जिला शिक्षा अधिकारी अपनी एक दो कविताएं आपके सामने प्रस्तुत करना चाहूँगा मैंने गीत काफ़ी लिखे हैं जो पुस्तक के रूप में आप लोगों के सामने कुछ दिन में आने वाले हैं तो लीजिए सुनिए जो मैं गीत गाने जा रहा हूँ कि चले गए मेरी कविता का शीर्षक है चले गए जिंदगी के मोड़ पर लोग हमको छोड़ कर सुदूर एक छोर पर चले गए चले गए कि जिंदगी के मोड़ पर लोग हमको छोड़ कर सुदूर एक छोर पर चले गए चले गए फूल से हृदय में शूल बींद कर चले गए कौन है वो क्या कहें हम तो बस चले गए उठ रही है एक कसक मन में भारी पीड़ है जिंदगी में क्या हो बचाओ आंख महन नीर है जिस जिंदगी में घोल कर कड़ब बोल बोल कर लोग रसन चोड़ कर चले गए चले गए चले गए चले गए सुदूर एक छोर पर चले गए चले गए मझधार बह रही है नाव दूर हमसे कूल हैं कदम उठाए किस तरफ हर तरफ तो शूल है लोग हंस रहे हैं आज मुंह को हमसे फेर कर अपने पर आए हो गए बकियाए दिल उधेड़ कर करे किसी से क्या गिला नसीब में था जो मिला मतलब के लोग गुल खिला चले गए चले गए चले गए चले गए चले गए चले गए जिंदगी के मोड़ पर लोग हमको छोड़ कर अब तक कटे सो कट गए जिंदगी के कुछ पहल गुजरेगी कैसे जिंदगी आगे तो है बड़ा कहर किस किस के सामने झुके ये शीस कुछ खबर नहीं किस किस के सामने झुके ये शीस कुछ खबर नहीं बर्बाद कर दिया हमें छोड़ी न कुछ कसर कहीं अफसोस आज इस कदर कि फिर रहा हूँ दर बदर लोग तो बता डगर चले गए चले गए जिंदगी के मोड़ पर जिंदगी के मोड़ पर लोग हमको छोड़ कर सुदूर एक छोर पर चले गए चले गए
Jaipur Literature Festival, protected by that all Banega Swast India. We are delighted to introduce a session, Navigating Cultures, the Land and Its People. M. Mukundan, Shabir Ahmed Meer, Lindsay Pereira, who will be right on your screen in a minute, Dariba Lindam and Vijay James in conversation with Deva Priya Roy, so a six people panel. Boundaries of the world are imposed, both physical and intangible, some natural, some imagined, and some imposed. All five novels shortlisted for the JCB Prize for Literature 2021 who are also presenting our session are emblematic of the reasons of, of which they write. In conversation with Devapriya Roy, M. Mukundan, Shabir Ahmed Meer, Lindsay Ferreira, Dariba Lindum, and Vijay James discuss the role of borders in their writing. All of their books of the part, part of the JCB Prize for Literature series are also available at our bookstore. M. Mukundan, our first panelist today, is a well-known fiction writer from Kerala and has over 40 books to his credit. He was presented with the, and do excuse me for, if there is a mispronunciation, for the Ezutachan Puraskaram, the highest eight award in Kerala, the insignia of the Chevalier in the Order of Arts and Letters by the Government of France, and is a two-time winner of the Crossword Award. He was president of the Kerala Sahitya Academy and won the JCB Prize for Literature in 2021 for his novel, Delhi, a Soliloquy. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. M. Mukundan. So if you could please come up on stage. Thank you. Our next author is Shabir M. Admir, a poet and writer based in Pulwama, Jammu Kashmir. He's the author of the book, The Plague Upon Us which was published by Hashit in 2020, which is now a couple of years ago. Sir, please may I welcome you on stage. Lindsay Ferreira, our third panelist, as you can see on the screen behind me, and also I'll be hiding so you can see him clearly, uh, is a journalist and editor. He holds a PhD in literature for his work on gender attitudes implicit in 19th century Indian fiction. He was also co-editor of the anthology Women's Voices, published by Oxford University Press. And his first novel, Gods and Ends, was shortlisted for the 2021 JCB Prize for Literature and Tata Literature Live First Book Award for Fiction. Maybe please have a hand for him. Dariba Lindum is a writer and civil servant from Shillong whose debut novel, Name, Place, Animal, Thing, was recently shortlisted for the JCB Prize for Literature. Lindum was named one of the promising writers of 2021 and beyond by the digital magazine Feminism in India and made it to the list of best summer reads of 2020 by Vogue India. Her reviews have featured in The Hindu, The Caravan and First Post amongst others. Our fifth panelist today, VJ James, was brought up, born and brought up in Kerala and writes in Malayalam. An engineer by profession, he worked at the Vikram Sarabhai Space Center. His debut novel, and I do apologize because I did not have time to ask him the pronunciation, 
Pura Padinte Pustakam or the Book of Exodus, bagged the DC Books Silver Jubilee Award and the Malay Tour Prize. His novel, Antique Lock, was shortlisted for the JCP Prize for Literature 2021 and has won the Ovi Vijayan Award and Thikurusi Award as well. Welcome, sir. Uh, Devapriya Roy, our panel uh, moderator today, I apologize, is the author of three best-selling novels, The Vague Women's Handbook, the Weight Loss Club, and Friends from College. In 2015, she published The Heat and Dust Project, co-written with Saurav Jha, which debuted number one on the Hindustan Times AC Nielsen list. Roy published Indira in 2018, a unique graphic biography of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi in collaboration with Priya Kunin. She is currently translating Tagore's Gora into English. Ladies and gentlemen, navigating cultures, the land and its people, M. Mukundan, Shabir Ahmad Mir, Lindsay Pereira, Dariba Lindham, BJ James, in conversation with Devapriya Roy. Good evening. Welcome to a discussion to a panel with India's most exciting writers. And I know that's something quite dramatic to say, but in this case, it's, it's, it's literally true. What the JCB Prize has done in the, last, uh, in the last few years since its inception is to introduce us to the most edgy work in literary fiction in India um, across languages, right? So uh, without further ado, I want to just dive in and ask our authors a few questions. What I want to tell our very sort of intimate audience today is that we will have 15, 20 minutes for audience questions, right? We want this to be interactive. Our authors want it to be interactive. They want to listen to you. They want to answer your questions. And as our senior most author, Mukundanji just told me in the green room that we want to hear from the readers, right? You ask a question or I just speak, how is it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so first question. Uh, shall I start with you, James? Um, Lindsay, I'm not going to forget you, okay? I can, I can see you there. Um, you can see I've done my homework, right? I've got a notebook full of questions. I didn't let them see what the questions but were. You didn't give us a chance to do homework. <laughs> All right. Um, James, you've written recently in a very moving essay. My stories and novels have evolved as the offspring of all the landscapes I have experienced since childhood. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? The world from which your books emerge? First of all, uh, let me tell that it is a blessing for me to be here along with uh, our dear Mogundetan, who is the pride of Malayalam language reading whose books uh, we all started writing. <laughs> Thanks to JLF as well as to JCB for making such an occasion for me to be here. And the question which you asked about the culture in which I was involved, because now I think that a writer, he writes something which he encountered within his life normally, uh, uh, which life he has, uh, because now, as far as I'm concerned, when I look backwards, I was born and brought up in a very uh, remote village in Kerala. Actually, I did my schooling in a Malayalam language school. Uh, that was the, in Kutanadu, in the coastal area of Kerala. Rather than uh, studies from this uh, in the classrooms, I, I think I got more lessons from outside the classrooms. That, is, that was the message which I wanted to convey to the audience and to you. I feel that a writer uh, never creates any story, in fact, according to me, because he takes all the stories from the nature. The stories have already happened and it's there in the nature. You know that when the apple fell on him, Newton's head, yes. uh, he became aware of the gravitational force 
and we study in physics uh, mm. newton's laws of motion mm. and then the relativity theory of uh, newton everything mm. but newton has not created these laws and theories actually he has only invented it the nature has created it and implemented it from time immemorial and newton happened to be the one who discovered it and revealed it to the world like that the writer also do the same thing the nature has created the stories it is there everywhere the writer has to tune to the frequency of the nature to access it hmm. when we are sitting here you know that so many radio frequency waves are here of different tv channels different radio channels if you are able to tune to a particular channel frequency using your mobile or laptop you will be able to access the stories and films and everything that is around us right the writer also does the same thing only he's through a channel he is accessing these stories actually the writer has got the role of a pen only according to me hmm. then uh, uh, coming to the uh, certain sometimes some apples fall on our head also right is right. also right. that is the initiative for each creation right. the first time the apple has fallen on me it was when i was a final year student hmm. i happened to attend the marriage function of one of my friends sister hmm. uh, it was uh, in the coastal area of the outskirts of cochin it was in an island hmm. it was isolated from the main land of cochin hmm. then when i entered that island i, I was really astounded hmm. because you know, the so peculiar one uh, the type of people they live the traditions which they follow the beliefs they have their ethnic cultures everything was entirely different than what i have experienced right. there right so it uh, felt to me that there are so many seeds of stories in fact which is buried under that fertile soil the stories to sprout buried under that fertile soil yeah, that kerala was, that is the ready uh, to sprout apple that has fallen on me <laughs> the apple that fell on him i love how many scientific uh, metaphors james gave us the writer as engineer also let's not forget right um, then then what i did is uh, many times i visited that land along with my friend i went in the inlets of the island and met different people i mingled with them in fact i danced with them their customary some dance was there because as a writer what i wanted to do is i want to experience these things first before i write it as far as possible right. i have written a story of uh, about uh, chore shastra uh, the science of thievery but i have not experienced the science of thievery but i studied it i interviewed some uh, in fact uh, some thieves oh <laughs> to get their experience about the thievery right to make that science of thievery just published in english by westland right. books that right. was my first book just published that was in translated english. in yeah. english chora shastra so we'll also come back and talk about research in in the in the next round thank you james uh i i don't know if we should Uh, if i should ask my next question to lindsay just because he's a little further away than than the rest of us um lindsay i'm looking at you i've been told to look at the camera to actually look at you okay uh you know when i was reading gods and ends i remembered this essay that uh, that the african american writer and intellectual henry louis gates junior had written about his own memoir colored people and he said that in that for the first time he believed he had lifted the veil from the way african americans lived their lives in private nobody had written about their lives in in the way um, that james chose to and then what i really uh, found very interesting about this essay is that he talks about how uh, he had gone to a book book event much like this today and he was he read out from it and then he was waiting to sign books and an old lady who reminded him of his mother walked up to him she was wearing lace gloves and way she was and very sternly she told him why have you why have you written this you know why have you opened up our world and shown it to 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 the white world that's what she meant um so linda you've written in a in a lovely little essay that your mother was upset when she read this book she was very moved but she was also it triggered something in her do you want to tell us a little bit about that um it is 
it is difficult. I think, you know, the, the way, when I think about why my mother reacted the way she did, or a couple of months after the book was published, I happened to participate in um, uh, uh, an online book club that ha that was featuring gods and ends and a number of people there told me that they were upset as well you know they they represented the community they felt as if I had said or talked about things that weren't supposed to have been shared with the with the world at large um, I think the, the problem lies with our inability to engage with difficult questions it's um, it's probably why the country is at the stage it finds itself in today. You know, our inability to engage with voices that are different from our own, our inability to confront the dark truths that lie at the heart of all our communities, whether we are Hindus or Muslims or Christians, our inability to ask questions of people who's, who claim to represent us is partly why we are at a stage where, you know, bigotry is now, um, the norm rather than the exception. And I think my mother reacted to the book in that way, primarily because of her refusal to engage with some difficult questions too. I don't blame her for it. I don't blame any of the readers for having that kind of perspective. I respect it, but I believe that it is only by confronting them that we can start to change the way we engage with the world, which is why I wanted to do that. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, Dariba, you, you, you said somewhere that in Name, Place, Animal Thing, by the way, Name, Place, Animal Thing, the title itself resonated very much with me because I think for a whole generation of us, that was the game we played in school, right? This was school before video games and or maybe not video games. That was just me being a geek, but uh, before phones and all kinds of cool things that kids these days do, we played Name, Place, Animal Thing. So Darima, you said that Shillong in your book is a character in its own right. It's not window dressing. And it's a character, and I really like the word you've used, with dignity. What did you mean, and what was it like writing about Shillong? When I, when I started, when I set out to write the book, I don't think I intended for Shillong to, have, to, play, to play such a role in the novel. But while the stories are all disparate and they appear to be connected through Shillong, they're all set in Shillong, they're connected that way. They can be read in isolation, but the one thing that runs across is Shillong. And because I live there, because I grew up there, I perhaps can give a lot of people who have never lived there, have never been there, never interacted with Shillong or its people, I can give you perhaps not a bird's eye view, but a more intimate view of a very small town that very few people know anything about. Whenever I talk to anybody who um, mentions, if I mention I'm from Shillong, the first thing they'll say is, oh, it's a rock capital of India or right. some such thing of the sort, or I have been to this waterfall or so, so on and so forth. They mentioned certain things, certain places. That's all very good and that's very fine. But mm -hmm. I don't know if they're really interacted with the city or the place. They have been to certain tourist destinations, but they haven't interacted with the people. Perhaps they haven't interacted with the food, mm -hmm. the culture. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with a, a lot of the way that Indians travel. I think they want to get on a bus, get off, look at a thing, say they've seen the thing and go back and mm. say, yes, I've seen mm. the thing, I've done the thing. I now know- I'm an expert on Shillong. Yeah, I'm now an expert on Shillong. <laughs> and I don't, I mean, who am I to tell anyone how to travel? But it would be good if you spoke to people, if you ate some of the food or you tried at least and you interacted with people more, you know, this was a way for me to show people that Shillong is different than your city, but the way we grew up, there's so many similarities. It's a geographical, it's different in geographical location, but there are many things in Shillong that a lot of people would agree with. I'm sure if you go to Shillong, there's so many things that are so similar to your small town. 
सो आई होप टू ब्रिंग पीपल टूगेदर फॉर एग्जाम्पल द नेम ऑफ द बुक इट इज अ वे टू हार्कन बैक टू अ टाइम दैट वॉज लॉस्ट पर हैप्स टू यू एंड टू मी हुआ मच ओल्डर नाउ एंड इन ऑर्डर टू काइंड ऑफ अरेस्ट यू पिक अप द बुक सो यू कैन पिक अप द बुक फील अ सेंस ऑफ यू नो फेमिलियरिटी then you read about the place and you're like oh i don't know this place but i am trying to make the unfamiliar familiar hmm right right to make the unfamiliar familiar and the familiar unfamiliar right correct the writer's job yeah. uh, with that i come to you uh, yeah. yes you've written about the city i live in delhi and uh, i too um, came to live in delhi from a from a different place and here sahadevan through sahadevan's eyes you show us delhi through the eyes of a young man who lives through two very important decades of indian history from 19 so it's sort of book ended by 1962 the uh, the war and the assassination of mrs gandhi and the anti sikh riots in delhi uh, you've written somewhere uh, that connot place is 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 the place that's frequented by beautiful well heeled people or as 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 we now say khan market is that place right yeah. but you didn't want to write about those people or those places yeah. you were more you you looked to the margins of the city where people who were struggling migrants who were struggling uh, lived and tried to build their lives so would you tell us a little bit about what inspired you well uh, uh, i our, our subject is navigation of culture navigating cultures yes. so let me yes. connect uh, yes. whatever i see to that uh, particular subject and in the meantime i would also like to say a few words about my childhood because james talked about his school days so we should always begin with our school days so when i was 4 years old my father took me to a nursery school in mahe The school was run by a Frenchman. His name is Charlie Master. He is a very elderly person, a Frenchman. Mm-hmm. Okay, and he had a beautiful daughter. So he taught us the alphabets. But in Malayalam, usually we learn the Malayalam alphabets A, A, E, E, N, all that. Or in English, A, B, C, D. But uh, I was taught the French alphabets A, B, C, D. so see my schooling started with that like that and i would though i was just 4 years old i told my sister well, look when you grow up you should marry his daughter teres because she's so good looking and uh, by the time i grew up she was already a mother of three children <laughs> so that was a tragic thing you know that happened in my school days i mean when i was 4 years old but now coming back to let's be serious and uh, coming back to the navigating cultures uh, you see i i believe that culture lives in a language yeah so wherever a language travels culture travels with that that's how this book delhi is a little it's about the malayali migrants uh, malayali who went to delhi and settled down there so so many malayalis went to delhi so when they went to delhi their language also travel with them mm. and hidden in, the, in their language the little malayali gods mm. or mm. the fragrance of mango trees mm. or the cool winds mm. all these things travel to delhi yes so for example yes. i went there i was not all alone i carried with me my river mahi river i and the, the cool breeze and the, all the this is the spicy food mm. and especially the little gods we had so many little gods in my we, we don't have great gods like shiva and all that we had very really powerful local gods mm. so i took all of them with me so i never went to delhi all alone see that that is how culture navigates when you go there you carry them so there are thousands of malayalis mm. in delhi all of them they did what i did so all the malayali gods migrated to delhi and they built their little uh, little temples 
in mm. places like Arkepuram yeah, and all that. Yeah, and I there are so many Malayali yes, restaurants course. where they sell uh, Malayali food. This is how culture navigates. And coming to your question about uh, the novel, why are, everybody asks me why you didn't write about good things. There are so many good things about uh, mm. Delhi. You know, there are good people, beautiful people, great people, charismatic people. And why did you write about such a uh, barber who works in the street or the gutter cleaners, people like that? Well, uh, you see what happened. I didn't do it internationally. But you, always the poverty attracts me. Poverty and suffering attracts me. So I didn't... Delhi was a beautiful place, there's no doubt. But there are... There's beneath the beauty, there is, you know, there is the reality, there's the poverty, mm -hmm. suffering and all that. So naturally I wanted to write about that. Right. Yeah. Right. That is why this kind of a novel right. was written. Mm -hmm. Then I'm happy about it, you know. <laughs> well, in the morning, right. uh, in the afternoon, we have another session. I explained why I wrote uh, about this thought of... Uh, and I had a problem. problem was to find a narrative uh, because uh, I, have, I have written in Malayalam in a very complicated language. But here, I wanted to write in a very simple language. So yes. I tried to develop a narrative, which right. is simple. And the novel was also serialized, right? So we'll come back to it and talk a little bit about what that means to the story when when it's being serialized in uh, Malayalam Weekly, uh, yeah, right? Malayalam. Uh, mm -hmm. So we'll come back to that in the next round. My question to Shabir. You've, you've written a very uh, powerful book that r writes Kashmir into being in its complex reality of today. You live and work out of Kashmir. How, how hard and heavy did that responsibility weigh upon you? How much of a responsibility is it upon a writer's shoulder, especially when there is so much violence and bloodshed all around? The responsibility, I think, is too great, particularly speaking from a perspective of an artist or a writer. I mean, uh, the article I wrote for the main, I used a metaphor there, the truth, if it hangs from a nose like a body, a rotting body, but the art has this urge to paint its uh, nails red, hmm. what is an artist supposed to do? I mean, at the end of the day, what does he owe his reality to? If suppose I am writing about Kashmir, but at the same time, I have to make certain decisions as an artist. So if there's a conflict between what I am writing about and what I want to write as an artist, I want to break free from my, you know, all that baggage. So how do I choose? What are my criteria to choose? Okay, this is good thing. I can do, take some liberties here. But that fine line, that, that distinction to make that choice is very, very difficult. And this is the question I have been asked time and again. How do you represent Kashmir? I'm not claiming to represent Kashmir. Right. Right. My only intention was to write a book, a story. That it happened to be about Kashmir was a very natural decision because having lived there all these years, having witnessed everything, that is bound to have an effect on you. And the story came from that very thing, that, that very time and space I was occupying. But that doesn't mean I'm claiming to represent anything. That my right. work represents something is totally a secondary question. My fidelity, my originality comes from my claims to the story itself. Right. Everything else is subsidiary and secondary. Right. I had read this uh, somewhere, and this was uh, Salman Rushdie's writing, that to understand a culture, look at what is untranslatable in it. We are talking about navigating cultures, and you, you do it twice, Mukundan James, you've written in Malayalam and that's been translated into English, but also Shabir, uh, Lindsay, Dariba, even the act of writing fiction is a sort of translation that the writer is navigating all the time. What was the one sort of cultural thing which felt the most untranslatable to you? And which you, we as writers, we try and we fail and we try and we fail again until the next time, right? So this is a question to all of you, whoever wants to go first. 
and i think you know that is this uh, the flavor of local language yes. that's extremely di difficult for example in malayalam there's not only one malayalam there are several kinds of malayalam mm -hmm. the malayalam spoken in north kerala is entirely different from the malayalam spoken in south kerala mm -hmm. and especially the place from where i am mahe uh, there is there is a french flavor there to mingle in mingled with the local mm -hmm. yeah there are some sometimes people use french words right and there is a very very local uh, flavor i think that is very difficult to translate, to translate. You know. this is how you know our great legendary writer povi vijayan he has written a wonderful novel the legend of kasak and uh, he translated it himself but mm. he couldn't you know translate the what i said you know the, the, the specific local culture and its flavors so that is very difficult to 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 translate right. other things i think you can when you feel right. very able to translate it, we can do it but mm -hmm. i don't know how to do this right. this kind of thing maybe the same thing the nuances, uh, james like can which, say yeah james yeah, what he says is uh, correct actually uh, when i write my book no i'll be doing a lot of research about the dialect uh, which uh, the local language for the conversation people are using after doing a lot of research when you present that when it get translated that flavor will be totally lost when it comes to english that is one thing then uh, as far as i am concerned i am uh, mainly focusing on some aspects of or some phenomena in life like that the philosophy of the that or philosophy of time etc when i right. talk in terms of philosophy right. and as well as in terms of science if the correct policy is not picked up right the translation it may get lost right and so what happens right. now uh, in such instances what we did is uh, i had an interaction with ministry we were having a give and take relationship hmm. so without hmm. any ego i can tell anything to ministry and ministry will tell to me so i will say uh, certain corrections when i tell to her if it is good she will definitely accept otherwise she will uh, tell james he don't work in english like that she right. will tell such right. a relationship was there so the translation of anti clock was uh, in that respect it was uh, an excellent way it went right right dariba i think uh when sir he he said it right when he said that certain local flavors lost and i think in my book there's a, a sprinkling of khasi that i never bothered to translate right. because I didn't feel the need to translate it. I just felt that people would. I, I believe we must trust that the reader will understand what you're trying to say. I, I believe the reader to be an intelligible, curious person who will go out of their way if they're very curious to know to maybe do a little quick Google search or maybe understand through context. Through context, what I'm trying to say. So uh, even when I was talking to my editor about whether we should keep footnotes. and we had this discussion for barely a minute because we were both in agreement with not translating no footnotes yeah, right no footnotes no translations we liked it the way it was we trusted the reader we understood that the reader is an intelligent person who would understand what i was trying to say right shabir what about you the one thing i feel that i have failed convey from my culture into the book is i think the level and the extent of violence that has seeped into our collective psyche i mean i have a practical proof of it my central character ubaid he does certain things during the course of the novel uh, which local readers they can understand they know how why he is doing what he is doing but i had this query from readers outside kashmir that why is your character doing this particular thing he can simply reject it he can simply walk away from all this and while writing this this thing didn't occur to me that uh, because i have also been uh, conditioned through all that violence that how malleable you became how responsive how conditioned your responses to the violence be it from state or from other quarters and that thing actually uh, i think i failed to convey and translate in my novel linze we haven't forgotten you no i i agree with uh, mr bupinda as well for different reasons i think that um the minute you are trying to to uh, talk about people who have a shared idiom and, and a dialect um they communicate in ways that people who don't have access to that dialect or that idiom simply can't fathom 
And for Mr. Mukundan and Mr. James, I think the challenges were different because you are working with uh, another language and trying to move it into the realm of how we communicate in English. But even within English, you know, that there are a thousand different kinds of English and people who navigate these different kinds of English. One of the examples I like to use very often is in some Catholic communities when people um, say things like eat khana men, it's really difficult for me to try and emphasize what that means, you know, because there are two nouns and a verb. The second noun suddenly starts to act like a verb to eat and a noun, khana. And the third noun, which is a collective noun, men, has no business being in that sentence at all. So the minute you have a question like that and you're trying to communicate with someone, everyone who shares that idiom gets it instantly. But for a copy editor or for someone who's writing and trying to get the reader to understand that, is very, very tricky. And I struggled with that. I don't know if I managed to do it, um, but I, I would say that was the, the, the hardest part. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, I did promise that we'll have more time for author questions. Um, so should we, should we open it up to the audience? I've got a whole bunch of questions for you guys, but let's see if, uh, if we want to take, yes, please. Okay. Yes, please. Uh, I think I was reading it when I was very young. And of course, that influence of um, uh, Ovi Bijan uh, was there because that made me from Baika Moment Bashir and also MT was there. And so entirely different. So did you have, uh, did the Ovi Bijan's, uh, uh, that novel really uh, influenced you or is there any way is there or or this is your own? I mean, because both of them are almost the same uh, location because you are talking about the culture and uh, the things in Malayalam actually change in some of your, most of your novels. So um, how, what influenced you to go to the cultural level uh, where the change really happened after MT or uh, Vaikam Omadoshi? You see, this novel, because most of you, I don't think you have read it, it's called On the Banks of the River Mayeji. Uh, th that's what he's talking about. It's, it's, it's in English, but it's out of print. It's for that book that uh, I won, so Crossword Award. So right. First, first Crossword right, Award. Right. Yeah, but unfortunately, it is now out of print. He's talking about that novel. And, oh, what uh, a pity. Uh, it's, it's about the freedom struggle in Mahe against the French, but it's not the usual kind of uh, historical novel because uh, we have a legend that uh, uh, far away in the sea, there is a cluster of rocks we call it silver, silvery locks. So we believe that um, all the people you know, who live in Maya, not only people, even the cattle, cows, and uh, all of them, they were there before their birth on this uh, cluster, cluster of uh, silvery uh, rocks. They were in the form of dragonflies, dragonflies. So from time to time, one dragonfly takes the form of a human being and comes to uh, comes see. to Mahe. So the the under people you know who struggled against the French, they were all dragonflies. So they flew over the Arabian Sea, came to Mahe, it's that little place. Then they did their historical role. Somewhere just uh, a lead writer or someone was a teacher, someone was a revolutionary, but they all did their work. And finally the French rule was thrown, they went back. Mahi was freed. There was a love story also, that story ends. Then at the end of the novel, all of them one by one, they go back to the, the, the rock, cluster of rocks, awaiting the next incarnation. So it's a cycle of, this is what uh, I wrote. And Vijayan is a really different thing. You yes. know, he's the master of language. Uh, is, uh, is writing, I can't convey it. It's such a magic of language. That's what sustains it. The writer. Mine is this kind of fantasy. Or, I, mean, I, I love fantasy. That's why I love Marcus. <laughs> right. That, okay, Thank this you. is what uh, I think Thank you. I said. There's a question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Also, please do introduce yourself when you ask your question. I'd rather go anonymous by okay, your permission. Okay, anonymous. Yeah. All right. Yeah. 
So uh, for each of the authors present on the stage, uh, did place or context, uh, did place or culture inspire the initiation of your stories or was it more inspired by your emotions and experiences and then fell into the context of place? Do you want to just repeat the question? question? Hold it closer and... Okay. Sorry, uh, I'll state the question as anonymous. Do you so, want to, yes, that's fine. Yeah. Do you want to just stand up and ask perhaps? It's, okay, it'll be uh, for each of the authors present on the stage, did uh, place inspire the story itself or did your emotion and experience inspire the initial seed of the story and then fell into the context of the place and culture? Right, right. Daiva, do you want to take that first and then any, any of you? I don't think I set out to write stories about Shillong. They just, uh, I happen, I set out to write stories and they happen to be set in Shillong. It's only later when you do a reading or when you're editing your book, you notice certain things that you didn't mean to do. For example, right, to be, for like I said, Shillong to have its own, to be a character in its own right. So you write not really thinking too much, at least that's my process. I can't speak for the rest. You write what you would like to write, a story you'd like to tell and everything sort of falls into place the way it should, I suppose. In my case, I would say inspiration is a very difficult word to use. I mean, yeah, the story is based on Kashmir, the story speaks of Kashmir, but to say that Kashmir can aspire the story that kind of projects a very positive thing. I mean, uh, the Kashmir, kind of tortured the story out of me. It was anti-inspiration. It was a man born in Kashmir who suffered throughout his life. There's one thing that if you choose a particular path of one side and then suffer for it, okay, you ask for it, you can make your peace with that. But a third kind of person who just wants to live, that's his only basic motto throughout his life to survive. Yet he's drawn into that vicious circle. He suffers every moment for it. And without, I mean, without being even a party to it, and that kind of forced me to write this. And that is why I say that I may not say it inspired me, but yes, it kind of anti-inspired me. Lindsay, I, I, no, yes, James, yeah. you wanted to say something. Please go on and then we'll... Uh, Lindsay is talking something. Lindsay? Oh, no, no. I, I'm just going to say that I agree with um, what Shabir said, and that is my response as well. Actually, as far as I'm concerned, there are three faculties involved in the writing. The five senses which occur from outside world, something we are occurring. That's the raw material which we get. Then the mind starts processing it. The emotions, everything is created by the mind. Sometimes the story also is developed through the mind. But the, the, then comes the intellectual part also. Intellect comes into play. What should be the structure of the novel? How you can edit it? How you can make it better? Because the intellect will think it as a product, whereas the mind will think it as a feeling or emotion. emotion so both should said. be balanced. This is the way we have to work. But there is another faculty uh, that also works in a person, a writer. Sometimes the writer may not be aware of it. But I can tell that I'm fully aware of it because during the process of writing sometimes, certain ideas which we will never think or which will never come in your uh, awakened state of mind will emerge from with from within during right. the process of writing only it will come right uh, that, that is why right. i used to tell that i cannot write a time bound basis i cannot write if there is a strong urge a strong call from within then only i will write otherwise i, I am willing not to write for years and i will enjoy the period of non writing also and i used to tell that my writing is my failure, failure of my attempts to not to write. That is my writing. Oh, what a wonderful, what a wonderful line that is. Writing is the failure of the non-writing periods of your life. Would you, sir, would you like to add anything? I, I agree with you. It's beautifully said. <laughs> beautifully summed up. I think all of us, sure. We've got a couple of uh, questions up front. Perhaps uh, the gentleman, here and then. Hello, very good evening to the entire panelists. Uh, I have actually two questions, one each to Mr. Shabir and Madam Dariba. Uh, first, Mr. Sharib, uh, Shabir, I would like to ask you that uh, you've written on Kashmir and uh, often we see that uh, there is a very blurred line that separates reality 
from uh, imagined realities and you come and you write about a place which has had a very complicated history so as an author uh, do you think uh, that uh, uh, it's a responsibility to actually enter and dwell into those aspects which have a very complicated past or do you try to avoid those aspects and go ahead and just otherwise tell your story my question to madam dariba would be madam uh, uh, do you think uh, uh, in in a way when people uh, try to understand about a certain place they have a very fragmented understanding of the settings in which the place has uh, grown out to be do you think that as an author we try to fill in the gaps of those fragmentations uh, in order to make a more complete picture into the minds of a, of an observer that's a beautiful question dariba do you want to go first and then uh, orsha be sure that's a very nice question i mean i think my novel is a response to that question the question of getting to the truth to the absolute truth or whatever you say see the structure of my novel is a single story told from four perspectives and those four perspectives join into form a kind of a jigsaw puzzle each piece providing a little depth to the overall narration so the answer is i don't claim and i don't attempt at presenting the truth of kashmir all i have tried to do is to give a reader an idea that there are truths that are beyond your comprehension just open your eyes don't go with a single thing take up everything you know there are facts and then there are interpretation and then there is that you know that blurred line where everything merges and something comes up my only attempt has been to answer that thank you shabir i think uh, when writing about shillong and my experiences or you know translating my experiences into fiction i'm relying on memory of a place i am no longer in so my memory in itself is fragmented so a fragmented memory will only produce a, a fragmented piece of a town i call home i myself am filling the gaps i do not completely understand and i don't want to pretend to understand that i know the place that i grew up in to its to its fullest extent i can only rely on the experiences i have that's why i hoped that the book would appear intimate to the reader because it was an experience of a girl who lives there so i very much stayed clear of things i do not understand in its entirety because i did not want to seem disrespectful so i was very conscious about that and that's why it is a very colored i would say narrative because it is seen through the eyes of one child thank you dariba um we had a question here uh, or should we take yes this one and then perhaps that can be the last question no. we are okay if we have time we'll also take yours sure uh, good evening everyone so my name is shubham sharma uh, my question is to you shabir and i would like to give a slight preface before i you know come to my question uh, so i think that you know india is not just india it's the united states of india you know and this uh, process of amalgamation started since 1947 you know rajasthan has uh, different riyasat then uh, uh, gujarat had you know junagadh had different riyasat then in punjab they are working so uttaranchal they are working then gwalior madhya pradesh they are working then in hyderabad you know we had to use force itself and Uh, since 1947 it has taken us 75 years to see the you know one large india right but with kashmir we still see some kind of separation okay so what's your take on this and do you think with you know uh, the reversal of section 370 do you think this process of amalgamation will start now uh you will excuse me just for a minute because i have a particular passage that particularly answers you meanwhile you can take the other question i will circulate it and i can read it to you sure sure all right, all right. should we uh should we have there was a young lady somewhere yes and then that will also fulfill my desire to have had readings uh i thought our session would go on for longer but at least we'll have one little reading Yes, yeah, me. Um well greeting my question is um at the time of writing and this is to you know, any of the panelists who is ready to answer um uh, as we speaking of cultures um how do you ensure 
uh, that cultural appropriation doesn't take place in your writing. A, uh, has it ever happened that during the process of your research or the time that you're writing, has it ever happened that you've recognized a sense of cultural appropriation yourself? Um, uh, if yes or no, however, how do you ensure to avoid it? How do you ensure that there's a sense of uh, cultural appreciation is taking place instead, right? And we uh, ensure to you know, garner all the elements of the culture and give the right picture. Um, that's right. my question. Lindsay, may I just jump in and ask if you would like to answer that question? Uh, it's an interesting question, but I also think it's given, given the, the nature of what it is we, we're talking about and how these five particular novels fit into um, this year's JCB shortlist. I, I don't know if I can speak for the other panelists, but I, I chose to write about a culture that I was intimately familiar with. So the question of appropriation didn't crop up. Um, we are living in times where writers increasingly question themselves a lot more than they used to, uh, which I believe allows them to uh, avoid the, the, the pitfalls of trying to appropriate another culture while trying to make a point. Um, you know, the, um, uh, a year ago, for instance, when um, a novel of, that was set in Mexico, written by a woman who wasn't Mexican, uh, went down to the bestseller list, that was a great example of, uh, you know, the pitfalls that writers in general have begun to avoid. Um, because these particular novels, and at least the one I wrote, uh, was very rooted in a culture that I happen to um, belong to, I managed to uh, avoid it. But I, I acknowledge and recognize that it is um, it is tricky and it is something that I believe, um, I, I know that I, I acknowledge and, and, and take very seriously when, when, I, when I continue to write. The next novel I'm writing, for instance, is not rooted in, in a culture that I particularly call my own. And I am aware of uh, those, those, those dangers. Thank you, Lindsay, for the very sensitive answer. We are out of time, so, so I- I'll try to make it- No, no, read it, read it. Take your time and read it. Okay, this is a reading I'm doing from my book between two characters, Ashfaq and Muzaffar. Follow me, Ashfaq said. He led Muzaffar to his favorite spot on the campus in little distance away from buildings where a tribe of Chinars had claimed a corner as their own. If he ever had to claim a country of his own, Ashfaq had once told Muzaffar and his friends, it would be this Chinar grove. The place did have a magical feel to it, Muzaffar had to admit, as though in this little slice of land, time had lost its way. To those who ventured here, a single moment could give a lifetime of peace, while an entire year could be squeezed into a careless minute. Ashfaq chose an old Chinar tree for them to sit under. Last night, you asked me something about Azadi, Ashfaq said in a solemn voice. Before I try to answer any of your questions, let me tell you something. See, we are a people who lost our way at the crossroads of history. We have been wandering ever since, like the Israelis of yore once they came out of Egypt. Only we have no Moses to lead us. In our history, we have had been made to take so many turns, so many by roads that we have created a labyrinth of our own. We now stand at the center of this labyrinth and yearn for a place where we should have been in the first place, a place outside this maze, a place called Azadi. But what are the actual contours of this Azadi? Some say it is just the redrawing of current boundaries. The boundary that makes us part of one country right now should be replaced by a different boundary that makes us a part of another country. Others say Azadi is the recreation of boundaries. We must have separate boundaries and a country of our own. And there are those who suggest various combinations of redrawing and creating these boundaries. In short, everyone who is here wants to get out of the labyrinth. Everyone who is here wants Azadi. But everyone does not necessarily want to end up at the same place. So when you ask me if I too am a supporter of Azadi, the answer is yes. I too want to get out of this labyrinth of despair. But I want to make it very clear to you what I mean by my Azadi. My Azadi is not a, not to replace one labyrinth with another. It's a place outside our labyrinths. A place where I'm free to be me, where power and authority, culture and institutions and rules and regulations are not thrust upon me, but where I choose them and also have the option 